Praise the Lord and God bless you, saints of the Most High God, uh, friends, all who are tuned in tonight to Bible study one more time. It is so very good to be here to continue to share with us from the word of Almighty God. It is a good thing for brethren to dwell together in unity, that is Bible, and I really want to welcome and greet all of us who are united to get into the word and to learn more from the good book. Welcome. We have been over the last couple of weeks going through and we want to extract as much as we can from the subject area of the tabernacle. Of course, the broader area is the church. And we have said it before, we are digging into the tabernacle to extract some things so that we can uh, apply it to the church that we are a part of today. And we are seeing some things opening up to us. As we look into the tabernacle, we see so much, we can pull so much, and we are recognizing that what was happening back there was pointing to what was to come in the future the tabernacle and all that was happening back there in its running in its operation was a shadow of things that were to come and it was all pointing to the real thing the real deal in terms of the spiritual connection and the real thing had to do with the church itself, the church of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then within that, uh, individuals, for example, the Lord Jesus Christ himself was typified in a, a lot of the things that took place at the tabernacle. And so we are learning bit by bit some things. And we did this amalgamation. We have undertaken this study because we wanted as we said early or earlier we wanted to zoom in on the church and hence we went from the beginning not the beginning of the church that we are a part of now which started in jerusalem on the day of pentecost but we went beyond those beginnings back to the tabernacle in the wilderness and from that we learned we have been learning a lot of things and we want to apply them to our lives today. But one of the things that we observed is that as those priests and as the high priests, as they all went about their job executing what they had to do in that tabernacle, we see some things jumping out at us. We see that those priests and all those that were associated with the work of the tabernacle, we see them taking seriously what it was that they were called to be a part of. They took seriously their respective jobs, the priests, those that were, of course, we know that they are from the tribe of Levi. But at the same time, apart from the priests, there were other workers uh, within the tribe who had different responsibilities within that tabernacle construct and what was important that we easily could pull out is that everyone associated with the tabernacle and with the whole tabernacle experience they took their roles seriously they understood that in carrying out their particular responsibility it literally was a matter of life and death. We see where when individuals circumvented the prescribed way of approaching God, God had to destroy them. They, as we go through, we would have seen, maybe we have not touched it as yet, but we will make reference to it at some point. Uh, Nadab and Abihu, these were sons of Aaron. And of course, in carrying out the actual tabernacle procedure, they had to do it in a particular way. We know that no strange fire 
could come into the tabernacle and if strange fire came in, there were consequences. We will touch on that to see what that represented and what it was all about. But the point is, they all took seriously the particular responsibility that they had being associated with the tabernacle. S similarly, as children of God, we are a part of the church, which we know now is the real image, the real deal. How much more ought we to take seriously our responsibility within the church of Jesus Christ? Know that we are saints. Know that we are a part of the family of God. We ought to take seriously what we have to do. Our roles, our ministry, our responsibilities as sons and daughters of God. We must take it seriously. Let us learn from what we are seeing in the tabernacle. How they did their thing with deportment. How they, they did their thing consistently. How they did their thing with dedication. How they did their thing with discipline. These are all things in terms of innate characteristics that does not change over time. And we apply these same things in our walk with God today. These are teachable issues. These are things that we must extract and we must embrace so that we can advance in our walk with God and know that we are walking in a particular way. All of this is signaling something to us. And the child of God that is serious, that seriously wants to serve him, that seriously wants to walk with God, must learn from these examples, from the pattern and the plan and the, the purpose and the things that we are seeing in the tabernacle. We must learn and then know and appreciate and understand how to apply it to our Christian walk today. It is very important. We in this 21st century are living in a time, are living in a, an era, an environment in which anything goes within the church. We have seen over the years the watering down of the foundational gospel message. We have seen over the years the watering down of some biblical standards and biblical principles that were bedrock within the church over time. But we notice that as time passes and as uh, the, the years roll on, things that once were sacrosanct, things that we would use the word to treat with and to deal with, we no longer use the word in that kind of way. So it now becomes a matter of, you know, what I think or how I feel. And this is spread right across the globe. We are seeing church in a totally different light. It is what makes me comfortable. It is what I am happy with. It is what makes me smile and feel good within myself. If we observe, just look, and especially in the United States and Canada, North America, we have to be very careful, brothers and sisters, not saying that church is only in Jamaica or only in the Caribbean or only in Africa. The church of Jesus Christ is everywhere. But we must be very careful, we must be very keen, we must be very watchful and understand that it is not everyone that says, Lord, Lord, and we must therefore dig into the book and be like the Bereans who, having heard things, consulted with the scriptures to verify. And we are living in the day and the age when we must verify, verify things that are presented over the internet and presented over television. We all are exposed to everything now. And so I want us to be very tactful and to be very discreet and to be in the word so that all the things that come our way we can verify because what you and I are in, what we are a part of is a powerful, it's a magnificent uh, gathering, a magnificent body a body of believers, and we are called upon to follow as 
best as we can and with the truest of heart the things that are written in the word a whole lot of things are happening a tremendous change is taking place in christendom but we must understand that there are some things that are foundational that are fundamental to this walk with god and by getting to the grassroots, getting to the foundation, understanding the principles that were established way back there in the tabernacle, we will see that we can ground ourselves in the church today and walk with God according to how he wants us to walk with him. I noticed and we saw it that Everything that Moses did, he tried and did what he had to do to make sure that it conformed to the pattern that God had given to him. Many times, a lot of the things is not up to us. There are things that we will, as a natural course, have to do as men, as we organize. But then there are some other things that we have no control over and we have to learn to get into the word and know that this is what the word says. This is the instruction from the Lord that is unmovable. There are other things that we do as men and fine. We will always have to do that in the course of ordering and conducting business. Again, that is fine. And whereas there are some things that we can do, there are other things that we cannot because it is established and enshrined in the word of God let us be careful that we treat it that we just look back at the tabernacle and see how they took it amen so that's what that's the reason why we are going through the tabernacle in this particular way in no way an exhaustive look at the tabernacle there's so much more but just to link it with us as Christians and with the church so that we can move on a little bit later on to deal with other issues related to the church of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why we are dealing with it in the way that we are dealing with it right now. So when we last met, uh, we were on the particular furniture in the tabernacle, which was the lampstand, the golden lampstand. And we had indicated that that lampstand was the only item of light it provided light for the priest in carrying out his function in the holy place that golden lampstand was very important without it the place would have been dark without it the priest could not see to carry out his other duties in that uh, holy place and so we must understand, saints of God, that that, and we said it last week, that that golden lampstand represent, it, it represents so much. It represented Jesus being the light of the world. He declared it that he was the light of the world. Amen. And Jesus being the light of the world, we, once we follow him, we cannot walk in darkness. And it is important when the light is there when the light is within us when the light is shining brightly we are able to see clearly so that we can perform and carry out the things that we ought to do as children of the most high god when jesus has lit up our lives we cannot hide it and should not hide it under a bushel once it is hid we are unable to navigate in the place in the space that we should operate and we would then have a problem. It is important, therefore, for us to understand that this light must not go out. One of the things that we said last week also is that there were churches in the book of Revelation because we indicated that the golden lampstand represents the churches, the church of our Lord Jesus Christ. It represents churches. And one of the things that we found out in Revelation chapters 2 and 3 spoke to us about the seven churches. And of course, the lampstand had seven candlesticks, seven prongs. 
and the church was represented by these. And one of the things that Jesus said to the seven churches that were there in Asia Minor at the time, that listen to me, be careful how you walk, lest I remove the lampstand out of its place. And we can easily see that the church ought to be shining, the church ought to be a light, the church ought to illuminate wherever it is that we are located. Folks must see us and see something different in us so that they can come to know the Almighty through our burning light. Be very careful. The caution that we closed with the last time is that even in Asia Minor where those churches were located, today they are no longer there. Today they are no longer in the place where they used to be. Brothers and sisters, I want to say to us, let us ensure that the light that must be continually burning, and notice, it was clearly outlined in Exodus where the lampstand was concerned, that that light, the priest ought to ensure that it never goes out. They were constantly uh, had to be going in to replenish that olive oil, to trim that lamp, to make sure that it was continually burning, to ensure further that the priests, every time that they went in to carry out their functions, to carry out their duties, they were able to see clearly and therefore do what they had to do correctly. The lights going out is significant and it is very serious. And so we encourage every saint of God, we encourage every saint in the church, in the house of God, let us keep our lights burning. No matter what, ensure that oil is continually flowing in our lives so that that oil will allow for the light to be burning, for men to see us, and for us to be an illuminating presence wherever we go. We must be able to see and to perform our duties properly. So having said that, we want to now move to the next item of furniture that that priest will meet upon in that holy place. Remember now, last week we said that there was a certain pattern, there was a certain procedure, there was a certain way that the priest had to do his thing in his quest to move closer to the presence of where God Almighty dwelt in that most holy place. He started out right at the front of the entire uh, layout, tabernacle layout. And the first piece of furniture, recall we indicated it last time, the first piece of furniture that was met upon, the first item of furniture that was met upon was the brazen altar. And that priest had to stay there, stop there. And as the folks from Israel came in with their sacrifice and they offered the sacrifice, that priest would then take the blood and sprinkle it and offer it and pour it in a basin and pour it at the designated place at that brazen altar. And then having finished his task at the altar, he then moved to the next item of furniture, which was the brazen laver. And right there, he was commanded to wash, lest he die. And so he's following the procedure. He's doing it the way that God instructed that it be done. And he stopped by the laver and he washed. He had to wash his hands. He had to wash his feet. And it is important to know that if he circumvented that piece of furniture, if he circumvented the brazen laver and did not wash, it didn't matter how the fact that he was a descendant of Aaron and that he was in the priestly line, if he bypassed any of those particular instructions, then he was in trouble. He could not proceed any further and if he dared to do that he would have been struck dead in the same way that Nadab and Abihu sons of Aaron were struck dead 
when they brought strange fire because they circumvented the word and the instructions of Almighty God. It is important that we understand that if we get into the word and the word gives us instruction and the word gives us guidance, we might not be comfortable with it, but be careful how we try to get around it. Everybody get, can use their intellect to get around the word. The Bible tells us that we must all repent, except we repent, we will all likewise perish. That's the word. And it doesn't matter who comes. If a man say we can get around this old repentance thing because we don't need to have to break down, we don't need to have to kneel and bawl out to God, a man can just say, God, just take me as I am or whatever, however he wants to put it. The Bible says, except we repent, we will all likewise perish. We cannot get around that. That is foundational. That is Bible. Be careful how we try to get around the word. Then the Bible said also, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. The Bible was clear in terms of the process of salvation. We must be very careful then how we try to get around it. And this is one of the things that we learn from studying the tabernacle. Be careful how we try to shortcut and circumvent the express uh, commands, the express word given by Almighty God. It's very important. And so the priest, having finished at the brazen laver, he then went through the tabernacle door into the holy place. And as we said, as he went in the holy place, he met up on three items of furniture. To the left, he would have met upon the golden lampstand, which gave light to the entire area in that holy place. And we already dealt with that. And we saw the scriptures. We got a glimpse uh, in a three-dimensional way just to see how the entire lampstand was set up. And then we went through some things that gave us a sense of what the golden lampstand represented and all. But then having finished at the golden uh, lampstand and the priest would have seen around, the lampstand was there, he made sure that oil was there and that the wicker or whatever that would have been properly trimmed to ensure that the light is always burning. It ought not to go out at no time. And so having done his due diligence right there, he then had to make a move to the next piece or item of furniture that was right there in the holy place over on the opposite side. And this was now the table of showbread. Uh, let us look at the scripture and let us get a little glimpse now of the table of showbread, how it is structured, how it is uh, the instruction that God gave them to set it up. Uh, we get a good three-dimensional view of it, and then we are going to touch on some things of what it represents and how it impacts us as Christians even today, what it signifies, and take a good look and feel of the table of shoebread. So we are taking our time now, and we are going through the entire tabernacle structure from the outer court, where there was the brazen altar, then the brazen laver. Now they have gone into the inner court, which is the holy place, and we are seeing the golden lampstand, and now that high priest has gone over to the table of showbread. What is the table of showbread? What is it about the table? What is it about the bread? What does this represent? Let us take a look at the command of the Lord and see what this thing was all about. Let's look to the slide right now. So that's the physical frontal feature of the table of showbread. The scripture there is Exodus 25, 23 to 30. And we just want us to have a three-dimensional view of this. And then we go right into it. You shall also make a table of acacia wood. Two cubits shall be its length, a cubit its width, and a cubit and a half its height. 
and you shall overlay it with pure gold and make a moulding of gold all around. You shall make for it a frame of a handbreadth all around and you shall make a gold moulding for the frame all around. And you shall make for it four rings of gold and put the rings on the four corners that are on its four legs. The rings shall be close to the frame as holders for the poles to bear the table. And you shall make the poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold that the table may be carried with them. You shall make its dishes, its pans, its pitchers and its bowls for pouring. You shall make them of pure gold. You shall set the showbread on the table before me always. All right, wonderful. Now, the table of showbread, saints of God, typified the Lord's life and ministry. Of course, there are a number of things that we will get from the table of showbread and the bread itself. And we will see different things that they represent and symbolize. But the table itself, the table of showbread, typified the Lord's life and ministry. Shittim which is acacia wood, is a, and we said it earlier, it's the same wood, it's a hard, incorruptible, indestructible wood that grows in the Sinai desert. As we saw with the brazen altar, it typified the humanity of Christ, who came as a root out of a dry ground, according to Isaiah 53 and verse 2, and was sinless in his human nature. The indestructibility of the wood spoke of Christ in his humanity as he withstood the fire of crucifixion uh, and the decaying effect of the grave and then his bodily resurrection. And very, very important. And the gold in the table was symbolic of Jesus' deity. So the Bible explicitly states that Jesus is divine. St. John chapter 1 and verse 1, St. John chapter 10 and verse 30, down to 33, St. John chapter 20, verse 28, speaks to the divinity of our Lord Jesus and ascribes such, such divine attributes to him as his eternal essence. There is no doubt about it. So it speaks clearly to his divine nature and the scripture lit, scriptures literally tells us saints of god that this man jesus this christ he has a dual nature a totally human nature and he also has a divine nature and both have come together amen in jesus christ and so the the the, the table itself typifies in the, that wooden aspect of it, the acacia wood, is humanity. And the gold that overlaid is divinity. And they both have come together. And that was and is extremely, extremely important. Now, the showbread on the table. The fragrance of freshly baked bread topped with frankincense literally filled the holy place. That fragrance was fresh. It was very nice. It was attractive to the nostrils. And it filled the entire holy place. Twelve new cakes of bread containing about six pounds of flour were arranged in two rows of six loaves each. And that was the basic setup. We see it right there. So one layer has six bread, pieces of bread, six cakes of bread. And the other layer similarly has six cakes of bread together uh, coming up with the 12 loaves or 12 cakes of bread 
which represented each loaf, each cake there, literally represent one of the tribe of Israel. So the 12 loaves represent the 12 tribe of Israel. Now, the term showbread comes from a Hebrew word that means bread of the face or bread of presence because the loaves were set before the face or the presence of Jehovah who dwelt in the Holy of Holies, right? And as a meal offering from the children of Israel. Leviticus 24 and verse 8 actually outlines that. So God gazed with delight on the pure bread offering that sat continually before his face. So it was called the bread of face or the bread of presence. And God would gaze upon this. Now, one of the things we want to highlight, God gazed upon this with great delight. Now, bread is called the staff of life and is symbolic of life itself, right? The showbread was a foreshadowing of Jesus Christ who is the true bread of life, giving unfailing sustenance to all who partake of him. He was, he was listen to this, he was born in the city of Bethlehem and Bethlehem, as we all know, means house of bread. Amen. So Jesus is pictured as the bread of life in many places throughout the scriptures. Yes? In St. John chapter 6, he is referred to as the bread of life who came down from heaven to give life to everyone who accepts him. And we know that as a fact. That's Bible. The day before he revealed himself as the bread of life, Jesus performed the miracle of multiplying a young boy's five barley loaves into enough bread to feed 5,000 men. And then after the meal, 12 baskets full of bread remained. And this we see in St. John chapter 6, verses 1 to 14. It gives us that entire episode. So without a doubt, Jesus is the, literally, the bread of life. And we are seeing it coming alive, the showbread on the table. Now, the showbread was produced from fine flour. Leviticus chapter 2 and verse 1. It tells us that, which speaks of the evenness and uniformity of the Lord's life and ministry. To make grain into fine flour, it must first be crushed, then it is grounded, then it is sifted. And this gives us a picture of the Lord's ministry. Jesus went through the sifting process of Satan's temptation. Note Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 to 11. And then the religious leaders testing him. Yet no sin was found in him. He went further through the crushing experiences when they scourged him, when they spat upon him, when they plucked his beard. And then finally he went through that crushing experience of crucifixion. St. Matthew chapter 27 verses 33 on gives us that entire episode and all of this was for the sin of humankind. Now the refined flour was baked into loaves. Another picture of Jesus who went through the fire of persecution, suffering, and then dying for us. Peter says it well. For Christ also as one suffered for sins. The just for the unjust. That he might bring us to God. Being put to death in the flesh. But made alive by the spirit. 
after the loaves were placed on the table now, they were sprinkled saints of God with frankincense as a memorial, and the remainder was burned on the altar of incense as an offering to Jehovah. So we are seeing that the showbread on the table typified and represented the suffering of Jesus Christ. But then similarly, the same thing can be applied to the saints of the Most High God. It speaks to us being placed in an oven. We first were beaten. We then had to go through a process where the grain is crushed and ground and then sifted just like what happened to the Lord Jesus. The very same thing, saints of God, happened to the saints of the Most High God. We have to be grounded. We have to be crushed. We have to be sifted. And when all of that process goes through, then that bread is, or that batter is placed in the oven. And whereas Jesus had his oven experience with them beating him and scourging him, plucking his beard, ours is a little different. We didn't have to go to a cross, but we, a cross, but we have our own experiences, every one of us, as we go through the crucible, as we go through the testings and the trials. But all of this is to bring us and to bake us and to make us into acceptable bread that is there inside the holy place. Now, notice, and we said it earlier on, that this bread, having gone through all that process, it was sprinkled, on top of it was sprinkled frankincense. And this is very, very significant. Now, frankincense is a fragrant gum resin with a kind of silvery white cast. It was ground into powder and burned on the altar while the priests ate the showbread on the Sabbath. What was it about this bread, that this frankincense that was placed on the bread? Understand, saints of God, that the frankincense has a kind of reference to the reverence and Oh, as we use frankincense, it speaks to reverencing, to being awe oh, at the presence of God. It had a fragrant aroma, yes? And what is happening here, it is speaking to us, first of all, being in the presence of God, reverencing the presence of God, standing in awe. Oh, at his presence and as we eat regularly we start to recognize more and more who God is and therefore stand in awe of the God that we serve and brethren beloved make no mistake about it make no mistake about this bread of presence it speaks to us reverencing and standing in awe at the presence of Almighty God. We are going to go through testings. We are going to go through trials. We are going to go through the crucible that will cause us to wonder. But then when all of this crushing and all of this uh, beating and all of this grounding and all of this sifting takes place, and then the batter is made and it goes into the oven. Then fresh bread comes out and is placed on the table, on that table of showbread. And brethren, very important that we understand that this fresh bread represents the word of Almighty God. We must eat regularly just like the priest when he went in there they constantly ate every sabbath that bread had to be changed and the priest had to the priest ate that bread 
every Sabbath. It did not get a chance to be steel because it was constantly being removed and replaced with fresh bread. It went through the process. It went through the grounding. It went through the sifting. Frankincense, which had a beautiful aroma, was placed on it. And then when all of that was done, the priest would come in and he would pull from this bread and he would eat it to sustain himself. And so this is speaking, this bread with the frankincense is speaking of the word, speaks to us about the word of God. It signifies, it's symbolic. It's speaking about that word of God, which we must ensure is constantly fresh, constantly being taken in by us. We cannot afford to have stale bread on the table of showbread. The bread must be fresh, it must constantly be taken off and be replenished and keep fresh. As we see this bread representing the word, it is signaling to us, saints of God, that we must constantly be in the word. We must constantly be drilling in, be eating, be embracing the word of the living God. Once we keep the word of God fresh in our lives, we will be able to be properly sustained to carry out the, our function as priests of the Most High God. Fresh bread, and that is very important. It must be fresh, it must be constant, it must always be replenished. And as we do this, then we start to get closer to God and we start to see more of Him to the extent that we reverence and stand in awe of this God. Amen? And more and more. A lack of word, having stale bread, we cannot draw nigh to him. Not being constant in the word, we will never be able to be in that place of awe and appreciate who he is so that we can properly reverence this God. And so that showbread that was back there in the tabernacle on the other side, opposite to the golden candlesticks, was a reminder to us to constantly, to first of all, know that we are going to have to go through a process to become this kind of bread. Then we must understand that the bread also represents the word of God that we must eat constantly, regularly, because it must be fresh and it must constantly be coming into our system. This will put us at that place where we can reverence the God of the word. And that is extremely important. Now, the third point that we have as a bullet point there is the service at the table. The loaves were gathered from, as I said before, the 12 tribe East Sabbath and used in two ways. First, they were brought as a unit by the 12 tribe as a portion of their labor to be dedicated to the Lord's service each week. Paul, the Apostle Paul, typified this in the church when he wrote, For we, being many, are one bread and one body. For we are all partakers of that one bread. 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 17. And so as one bread in the Lord, we are to give sustenance to one another by exercising our gifts within the church. And this is a, an important concept for us, for us to always follow. Second, the bread provided food to be eaten by the priests on the Sabbath in the holy place. And it pretty much captures what I said just a while ago. We as believer priests, according to 1 Peter 2 and verse 9, are to, are to feed on Christ, who is the bread of life, receiving in return spiritual sustenance and strength for worship and service. Jesus is the source of our spiritual vitality and fruitfulness in his service. He said it, without me, you can do nothing. St. John 15 and verse 5. And that is indeed 
very, very, very important. Today, many Christians are spiritually starving. Some attend church that only feed them the humanistic, philosophic opinions of the world. When you go to some places and you see and hear what transpires and in those places that call themselves churches, it is just a social gathering. It is just a place that caters to the intellect and intellectual philosophies. But I want us to understand that the church of the living God, when we gather together, there must be impartation of the word. We must get something, the spoken word, the written word. We must read into the Bible. We must get the written word. We must listen to the spoken word. We must put them together. It's more than just going to share with people about what happened to them. The testimonies are good. We overcome the dragon by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. We must testify. But brethren, beloved, understand when we come into the house of God, this particular part of it, Make sure that we grasp something from the word that is read. Make sure we grasp something from the spoken word. This is extremely important. We cannot in this 21st century where we have the Bible, where we have the word that we can open from Genesis to Revelation and be spiritually starving. That must not happen. That must not happen at this point in our Christian walk. And so I encourage us to understand that what we are seeing on the table of shoe bread, it is basically saying to us, get into the word. It represents a fresh word, fresh bread, fresh word, new anointing that comes with the word, new illumination that comes as we get into the word. It is very, very important that we place a lot of emphasis there. Now, that being said, we realize that having gone to the golden lampstand, having gone to the table of shoe bread, then the next item of furniture, because in the holy place, there are three items of furniture. The golden lampstand, the table of showbread, which we have looked at those, and then the third one, which is closer now to that veil that separates the holy place from the most holy place. There is a third item of furniture, and it is called the altar of incense. And let us just get into the altar of incense. Let us listen to the scripture, look at the 3D presentation, and let's then look at some pointers as to what we can glean from the altar of incense. You shall make an altar to burn incense on. You shall make it of acacia wood. A cubit shall be its length and a cubit its width. It shall be square and two cubits shall be its height. Its horn shall be of one piece with it, and you shall overlay its top, its sides all around, and its horns with pure gold, and you shall make for it a moulding of gold all around. Two gold rings you shall make for it, under the moulding on both its sides. You shall place them on two sides, and they will be holders for the poles with which to bear it. You shall make the poles of acacia wood, and overlay them with gold. You shall put it before the veil, that is before the ark of the testimony, before the mercy seat that is over the testimony, where I will meet with you. Wonderful. Now, brethren beloved, we are going to look at the altar of incense, and we are going to just look via these particular subheadings, the pattern of the altar. And we start with the pattern of the altar. Now, we, we, we realize the golden altar of incense was 36 inches high and 18 inches square. And brethren, it was a much smaller 
piece of furniture than the brazen altar. We said it earlier that the brazen altar, that we, that which was the first item of furniture, was the largest piece of furniture in the entire tabernacle setting. And um, this golden altar was much smaller than the brazen altar. It was made of acacia wood covered with gold and had a horn at each corner. A gold rim encircled the top with gold rings at each corner. And acacia wood staves covered with gold were put through the rings to transport it. We, we saw it in the 3D presentation. Now earlier we noted that acacia wood covered with gold was a picture of Christ's humanity and deity wedded into one person for lack of a better term. And John expressed that union beautifully when he said, and he wrote it in St. John chapter 1, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. St. John chapter 1 and verse 14. So we basically see the pattern of the altar, and that came across clearly in the, in the 3D um, presentation. Now the placement of the altar. Placing the altar before the veil, Exodus 30 and verse 6, was of great significance. The golden altar stood next to the veil in the center of the holy place, which separated it from the holy of holies, where God's manifested or manifest presence dwelt. Thus, the closest the priest could come to God in daily worship was when they ministered at the altar of incense. The same principle holds true for Christians. The closest we can come to God is through prayer. And that is a very, very important concept. Again, we state it for significance. The, the the furniture closest to the Holy of Holies was the altar of incense. And this is extremely significant. The Shekinah presence of God dwelt beyond the veil, right beyond that veil where that altar of incense was, is where the Ark of the Covenant was that housed the Shekinah presence of Almighty God. No. Incense represents prayer and intercession. And so what we are picking up from this, that if we are going to be close to where the presence of God is, we are going to have to spend time at the altar of incense. You're talking about intercession. You're talking about prayer. You're talking about spending time there. It is the closest. It is what will ultimately take us into the very presence of Almighty God. And we must not let this be lost where we are concerned. If we are going to get into the very presence of God, we must spend time at that item of furniture closest to the presence of Almighty God where that Shekinah dwells, that place of prayer. It is very, very important. Now, there is something I want to bring to our attention. The preparation of the incense, right? The incense was made from three specific sweet perfumes, according to Exodus chapter 30 and verse 34. And they were mixed with frankincense. Now, when these came together, and this mixture, the sweet perfume and the frankincense came together, the sweet-smelling incense, incense was a beautiful picture of Christ in all his perfection and grace before God and man. His life emitted a fragrant perfection of purity and holiness unmarred by sin or fleshy motives and that was extremely extremely important the, did you know brothers and sisters that christians are called a sweet savor to god 
and to the world. Just look at 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 14 to 16. We see it coming out. Now, as we move through society, we are like incense that has been crushed and burned, emitting the perfume of the knowledge of Christ to the glory of the God that we serve. The world responds in various ways to Christians as they emit the fragrance of our Lord Jesus Christ. To those who are lost and indifferent to the gospel, the incense of Christ is the savor of death unto death. But to those who respond to our weakness as children of God, Christ is the savor of life unto life. Some of the incense was beaten and put before the testimony, the Ark of the Covenant, in the tabernacle outside the Holy of Holies, ready to be used when necessary. So it is with Christians whose hearts should be prepared before God to offer up the sweet incense of prayer. Brethren, beloved, this is very, very important. On the altar of incense lied, were placed hot coal. And then what would happen is that the priest would take this fragrant incense that was specially made, sweet savor, tree specific type, and they were made in a particular way with particular amounts of each coming together. And then it was mixed with the frankincense. So this was a particular kind of mixture. And then this fragrant incense was taken and placed on the hot coal. When this was done, the aroma was sweet. But then a big smoke emanated, was pushed up into the atmosphere. And that place in the holy place was constantly having this smoke of the presence from the altar of incense. This smoke, as it continued to come up, to emanate from that altar, it, with that sweet aroma, represented the intercession, as I said before, and the constant prayer of the saints of Almighty God. And it is important that we know that that was constant. It was always going up. It was always permeating the atmosphere in the holy place. And it is signaling to us, saints of God, that we must be constantly in prayer, constantly interceding for our brethren, for those folks that are lost in the world, we must constantly be in the presence of Almighty God. If we are going to draw nearer, because when we finish at the altar of incense, it is only the veil that is left to go through to get inside of that very presence of Almighty God. And so it is important that we recognize that intercessory prayer, that praying is something that is very, very important to the God who asks us and demands that we pray. He ensured that prayer is what ushers us into his very presence. A prayerless saint is a powerless saint. A saint who is not praying is a saint who is going to be far from the presence of Almighty God. And so it is important that we use this as a, what I would call, yardstick, so that we can know saints of God, that if we are going to go into the presence of God, if we are going to abide into the, in the presence of God, if we are going to be near to the Shekinah glory, the Shekinah presence of God, we have got to be people of prayer. We have got to be people of intercession. We have got to be people who make it our duty to pray and pray without ceasing. That is extremely important. Moses ended his description of the golden altar 
and his ministry by calling it most holy unto the Lord. Exodus 30 and verse 10. This is how Moses described this altar of incense. This, this golden altar of incense. Most holy unto the Lord. Why? Because it is what transports us into the presence of God. It was the next step through the veil that would take us into the very presence of Almighty God. So next to the Ark of the Covenant, it was the most sacred piece of furniture in the tabernacle, illustrating saints of God, the tremendous importance God puts on our communion with him in prayer. Very important. Do you cherish the high holy privilege that is yours to enter the throne room of God and converse with him in prayer? Sad to say, this important privilege is often minimized in our walk with Almighty God. God has much to say concerning prayer. He has made it clear that prayer should be a priority in our lives. We are commanded to pray without ceasing. 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 17. We are not to become weary. Right? He said it in Luke 18 and verse 1. Men ought always to pray and not to faint. We are to pray in order to strengthen ourselves against the destructive onslaught of Satan. Watch ye and pray lest you enter into temptation. Mark 14 and verse 38. Without prayer, saints of God, Christians become spiritually weak and powerless in their walk before the Lord and their testimony before others. And we must guard against that. We must be very vigilant against that. It is important that we understand that. Set a time to pray. There were certain specific prayer hours back there and the priests had their set prayer time for sure they prayed in the morning they prayed in the evening and they had certain prayer times that were set the very thing came over into the church the new testament church and if you recall at one time peter and john i believe it was was going up to the temple to pray to the synagogue at the hour of prayer this was when the church was formed. This was when the New Testament church was in place. On their way, a certain man stopped them. But they were on their way at the hour of prayer to the temple to pray. They had a set time to pray. And I'm submitting to the saints of God tonight that we must set our prayer time because prayer is so important. It is, symbol, it is symbolized by the altar of incense, which is that last piece of furniture and symbolizing prayer and intercession. It is what ushers us into the presence of God. If we are going to be strong, we must pray. If we are going to hold, we must pray. If we are going to make it, we must pray. And so the altar of incense is very important to us understanding and seeing the significance, amen, and the urgency of the hour in praying. The golden altar of incense, of incense stood before the veiled holy of holies. And we said that, just to give us some pointers again here, the altar typified Christ as our high priest who intercedes for us and the believer who offers the sacrifice of praise. And so we must constantly be praying, and we must constantly recognize that as we pray, and as we offer up the sacrifice of praise, our intercessor, none other than Jesus Christ, who is represented by that altar itself, because it was acacia wood, shitim wood overlaid with gold, and so it speaks to our mediator who is both God and man. And the human part, the mediator is our Christ. And he is there to receive our praise and prayer and present it to God 
so that it becomes effective and God does what he has to do. I made the point earlier on that burning coals from the brazen altar were placed on the altar of incense over which the sweet incense was poured daily. And then the smoke from the incense represents the prayer of God's people. This must be done daily. This must be done at specific times in the day. This must be consistent. We must be disciplined in doing this. And brethren, beloved, as this is done, then we are going to see that we become stronger and stronger Christians. And as we become stronger and stronger Christians, we are drawn. We push beyond the veil and we go into the very presence of a holy God and of the living God. And this is important for us to appreciate. Now, as we move from the golden altar of incense there is one thing separating that priest from going inside the very presence of God in the holy of holies and that is a veil right and it is only the high priest that is able to go beyond that veil into the presence of of the living God who abide between the folded wings of the cherubim that is on the mercy seat. Yes, the veil. And all of us must recognize that we can go beyond that veil. There was a time when it separated, but it is different now. But let us just look quickly and see what this veil used to do and then we take it from there present some pointers until we move right into the holy of holies Veil woven of blue purple and scarlet thread and fine woven linen it shall be woven with an artistic design of cherubim you shall hang it upon the four pillars of acacia wood overlaid with gold and their hooks shall be gold upon four sockets of silver. And you shall hang the veil from the clasps. Then you shall bring the Ark of the Testimony in there behind the veil, and the veil shall be divided for you between the holy place and the most holy. Wonderful, wonderful. No. Under the placement of the curtains, I want to make a point, a very important point. Three curtains were placed strategically in the tabernacle. Each one made of fine twine linen into which twisted threads of blue, purple, and scarlet were interwoven. Although beautiful to the eye, the veiled entrance of the tabernacle was not to be objects of admiration. Rather, they performed two basic functions. All right, so the word veil means to separate, and this literally describes its ministry. The veil acted as a barrier between God and man, shutting God in and man out. Leviticus 16 verse 2 speaks to that. And the curtains permitted access to worship after the priests had met the requirements, there are the required conditions set forth in the law. Now, the first curtain, the gate of the court, Exodus 27. So, this is the curtain that is outside in the courtyard, in the outer court. There is a curtain there which is called the gate. It, it was seven and a half feet high high and 30 feet wide and was supported by four pillars set in bronze socket so that was there and that was the first curtain first set of curtains that one encountered when coming into the presence of God this curtain separated the people from the tabernacle court so that curtain, that was the first one that was there at the gate in the outer court. That was a curtain. 
and it separated those that were outside and those that were in the courtyard. They brought their sacrifice to the gate as an offering to God. Now the second curtain is the one that was hanging from the door at the tent. So after you came through the first curtain, you then see the brazen altar. And then from the brazen altar, you go to the brazen laver. Once the priest is finished at the brazen laver, he comes to the second curtain. And this is the hanging for the door of the tent. It is through this curtain that he goes in and enters into what is called the holy place. And as we said, the holy place is where you had the three items of furniture, the golden lampstand, the table of shewbread, and the altar of incense. But then there is a third curtain, which is called the veil, and this is where we are at now. And this third veil, the one being focused on now, as I said, divided inside of the tabernacle into two rooms, the holy place, that I just described with the three pieces of furniture, and the holy of holies. Now this veil between the holy place and the holy of holies is described as a skillful work. The workers were given special divine wisdom in, making, in the making of this beautiful veil which has never been duplicated. This veil was a separator. It separated men. It separated the priests. It separated even the high priest in that he could only go beyond that veil once per year. And it is important that we recognize that fact only once Per year. So in terms of the placement of the curtains, one was at the gate at the front through which the folks would come in into the outer court and bam, they did what they had to do there and the priest took it on and went further to the brazen laver and then the priest would come to the second curtain which was what carried you into the holy place. In the holy place, the priest did what he had to do, came to the golden altar of incense, finished his work there, and that was it for the priest. There was a veil that was there now that separated the holy place from the most holy place that the priest himself could not go through. That was the third veil, and that was the placement of the curtain from the front right up to that particular point. Now, the other point, bullet point that I want us to um, see through is the provision through Christ. What the veil represents, the provision through Christ. The veil was a graphic picture of the Lord's life and ministry. As the veil in the tabernacle hid the Shekinah glory of God, so the divine glory of God was hidden during Jesus' earthly ministry. Paul wrote, Who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a, serpent, of a servant, sorry, and was made in the likeness of men. Philippians 2, 6 to 7. So we are seeing here that the glory, the glory, the Shekinah glory, which is Almighty God himself represented, it was hidden by the veil of the flesh of Jesus Christ in the same way that that same Shekinah that was in the Holy of Holies was bright and brilliant and resided on that mercy seat. It was hidden from everybody else on the outside by that veil. But thanks be to God, something was going to happen later on that would have 
remove that veil once and for all and allow men to see who the Almighty is having passed the veil. Now, the privilege for Christians, for Christians, the Ren veil means that we have a mediating high priest who has opened the way for us to have access to the throne of God. It means that we can come at any time into the presence of God with the confidence that we will obtain mercy and find grace to help us in any need we wish to express. So what is happening here is that the veil that was there in the tabernacle was a separator. It separated the priests from God. And only once per year could the high priest, not even the priest, but the high priest, only once per year could he go into that place where the presence, the Shekinah presence of God was only once per year could he go in and not without blood. And then he did what he had to do in that section. But for him to get there, he had to go through the veil. And that veil was impenetrable in the sense that if you dare to go through outside of the time designated to go, you would surely die. It was a separator. You couldn't go there. The presence of God was there for sure, but only the high priest could access that presence and only one time per year. But thanks be to God that Jesus, upon his death on Calvary, on the cross, upon his death, that veil which was in Herod's temple at that time, when Jesus bowed his head and gave up the ghost on that cross, the writer puts it and penned it, that immediately the veil, that same veil that was in the temple, is the same veil that was in the tabernacle in the wilderness that separated the holy place from the holy of holies. And that veil upon Jesus' death was rent in two, the Bible says, from top to bottom. You know what happened there, saints of God? Access to the holy of holies, where the presence of God would normally dwell, was now accessible, was now available, and Jesus' death allowed for that. No longer do we need a high priest back there to take our petitions and carry it into the Holy of Holies to present to God for us. Jesus, our high priest, have once and for all torn the veil. In other words, he doesn't even carry it in that way that he goes for us and we cannot go. He literally tore the veil from top to bottom, allowing access to the very presence of Almighty God. This is the privilege that the Christians today have. Back there, only the high priest could have gone beyond the veil. Today, Christians have the great privilege of walking right into the presence of of the living God. And that is something that is very significant. That is something that we cannot take for granted. And we thank God that the veil has been rent from top to bottom. We can go into the very presence of God and see for ourselves what is there. Because beyond the veil, there is another item of furniture. Beyond the veil, there is something more. The ultimate prize when we go beyond the veil, the very presence of Almighty God. And I challenge and charge all the saints of God. I challenge and charge every child of God to do what we must do to make sure that we look beyond the veil and not just look beyond the veil, but go beyond the veil into the very presence of God. He has now made that possible. And that is extremely, extremely, extremely is important. Now that we have gone beyond the veil, now that 
we recognize that that veil which was a separator separated the Holy of Holies from the holy place, separated the priests from going into the presence of God, separated everyone else except the high priest who could only go once a year, separated them from seeing and experiencing the Shekinah glory and presence of God for themselves. Know that that, temp, that veil is rent in two because of what Jesus did when he sacrificed himself on Calvary. We have now been ushered into the Holy of Holies, the very presence of God. What is it when the high priest went into the Holy of Holiness, of Holies? What was it that he saw? What is it that we will experience when we push beyond the veil and we go into the Holy of Holies? Let us look and see. This last piece of furniture is what resides in the most holy place. This last piece of furniture is what gives us a sense of how God operates and establish himself and inform us as to how we can approach this God and how glorious and magnificent and awesome this God is that we serve. The Ark of the Covenant, Exodus 25, and from 10 to about verse 22, gives us the description, the instruction that God gave to Moses to build it, and then we see how it comes together, and then we have a few pointers from there, and then we wrap up with this last piece of furniture, and we move on from there. But let us just look at the Ark of the Covenant and see what it symbolizes and what it represents. And they shall make an ark of acacia wood. Two and a half cubits shall be its length, a cubit and a half its width, and a cubit and a half its height. And you shall overlay it with pure gold. Inside and out you shall overlay it, and shall make on it a moulding of gold all around. You shall cast four rings of gold for it and put them in its four corners. Two rings shall be on one side, two rings on the other side. And you shall make the poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. You shall put the poles into the rings on the sides of the ark that the ark may be carried by them. The poles shall be in the rings of the ark they shall not be taken from it. And you shall put into the ark the testimony which I will give you. You shall make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two and a half cubits shall be its length, and a cubit and a half its width. And you shall make two cherubim of gold. Of hammered work you shall make them at the two ends of the mercy seat. Make one cherub at one end, and the other cherub at the other end. You shall make the cherubim at the two ends of it one piece with the mercy seat. And the cherubim shall stretch out their wings above, covering the mercy seat with their wings, and they shall face one another. The faces of the cherubim shall be toward the mercy seat. You shall put the mercy seat on top of the ark and in the ark you shall put the testimony that I will give you. And there I will meet with you, and I will speak with you from above the mercy seat. From between the two cherubim which are on the ark of the testimony, about everything which I will give you in the commandment to the children of Israel. Amen, amen, amen. And so the construction of the ark... Praise God. Now, the ark was symbolic of God's throne and presence, making it the most sacred article of furniture in the tabernacle. In fact, the tabernacle was built to house the ark of the covenant so that God could dwell among his people. 
All right? So it's important that we understand all that we have seen before, all that we have discussed before, everything from the brazen altar to the brazen laver coming all the way into the holy place with all the other items of furniture, the golden lampstand, the table of showbread, the altar of incense, all of these things were put in place and the tents and everything set up for one main purpose and that main purpose was to house the Ark of the Covenant where the presence of God reside. It is all about the presence of the Lord and it was the first item of furniture made after God instructed Moses to build the tabernacle, Exodus 25, 8 to 10. So when God gave the instruction to build the tabernacle and everything, the first thing that was built was the Ark of the Covenant. And that was very significant. Now the Ark was called by many names. It was known as the Ark of the Testimony because it was where the two tables of the law were kept. The Ark of the Covenant, speaking of God's covenant relationship with his people, the Ark of God, the Ark of the Lord God, the Holy Ark, and the Ark of thy strength, all of these things it was called. And it has its specific reasons why they were given these specific names. Now, the Ark is one of the clearest types of Jesus Christ presented in the Bible. As with the brazen altar, the table of showbread, and the altar of incense, the acacia would typify the Lord's life and ministry. And we have gone through all of that already, talking about the indestructibility of the wood, and that speaks of Christ in his humanity, withstanding the fire of crucifixion, and then the, and all. We have gone through all of that already, and so we are clear as to what those things now, we also went through the fact that the ark of wood overlaid with gold typifies the divine and the human nature of our Lord, you know, that he possesses. So we had gone through all of that. Now, the ark in the Holy of Holies was symbolic of the Lord's glory in two ways. First, as the ark dwelt among mankind, so Christ was manifested to mankind during his earthly pilgrimage. Secondly, as the ark represented the throne of God where he manifested his glory, so Christ Jesus is seated at the right hand of God in all of his glory. Ephesians 1 19 to 23 speaks to that. Now the contents of the ark, Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 4 states that the ark contained three objects. The golden pot that had manna, one, two, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant. It had been suggested you know, some folks said that more things were, but really it is three things that were there. The manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tablets that had the Ten Commandments in them. Now, the manna, the first item mentioned is the pot that had manna, which was the food provided by God for the children of Israel during their 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. The word manna is a transliteration of two Hebrew words expressed in English as what is it? It's almost like a question, what is it? Manna, it really meant what is it? It is also known by three other names. Bread from heaven, light bread, angel's food. This is what they children of Israel call it at different times. And essentially, what was happening in giving the manna, God revealed that he was able to meet and sustain the physical and spiritual need of his people. So God kept back a pot with manna in the ark of the covenant where his presence was and this was saying to folks then and saying to us today 
that the God that we serve is a God who is a sustainer, a God who is our keeper, a God who knows how to take care of his own. In the Ark of the Covenant was a pot of manna, which was a constant reminder that our God is our keeper. He provides in the wilderness when there is no food in the wilderness. He makes a road in the wilderness when no road is there. He knows how to sustain us physically. He knows how to sustain us spiritually. And that is a constant with the God of our salvation. And so the Ark of the Covenants has in it that pot with manna, which is a constant reminder of the faithfulness of our God who is our sustainer. Then the other thing that was in the Ark of the Covenant was Aaron's rod that budded. And here was it now, that rod that budded, it, did, it, 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 was not, it was like a branch. It was broken off and it was just there by itself. It had no root planted in the ground. So it cannot get nutrients, it cannot get water, it cannot get anything from the soil. And yet, it was in the Ark of the Covenant for years with no root in the ground. How did it survive that it was still able to bud and to have a leaf or to have leaves and bud? In other words, almost bearing an almond. It is speaking that God is the source. We don't need the earth and the nutrients from the earth. God is the source and he is the life giver. He is the initiator, the originator, our source. If we want life, it is only found in Almighty God. And that Aaron's rod that budded is a constant reminder that God is our source. He's the source of life. He's the source of strength. He's the source of everything. We can be detached from the system of this world and still live. Because our help, our source, our life is not from the natural earth. But our source, our life, is from the presence of Almighty God. And what it is saying is that in the presence, the very presence of God, we get life. In the very presence of God, we are sustained, which is what the manna represents. We have life. Our source is in the presence of God, which is what Aaron's rod that buds signifies. And the third thing that was in that Ark of the Covenant was the tablets that had God's word. God's word will always, always be sacred. God's word means everything. He honors his name above his word. And so when it comes to the fact of God's word, when it comes to the fact that he is the source, when it comes to the fact that he is the sustainer, it is a reminder to all of us by it being placed in the Ark of the Covenant where the very presence of God reside, we are reminded of his awesome ability to sustain, to sustain, to be our source, and a reminder that his words are sure, and his words are forever, and his words will always abide. And so, brothers and sisters, we pretty much have this understanding that the Holy of Holies is where the presence of God 
reside. The Holy of Holies is where the Ark of the Covenant reside. It is where the presence, the manifest presence of Almighty God reside. And today, within the church, within the life of a Christian, it is important that we understand that with the veil now removed, with the veil now parted, we have access to the very presence of God where we can experience his awesome power to sustain, his awesome power by virtue of his word and his awesome power that indicates that he is the source of all. When we come into the presence of the living God, we have it all. This is the sovereign God and we have this privilege, every child of God, that we can come before this great sustainer, this source of all things and the one whose word alone is life. By his word, he spoke and the world came into existence and every child of God has access to the presence of this great Jehovah, this great God, as a result of our going beyond the veil and go, coming into the holy of holies. And this is very significant. And this is something that we must all, all, all appreciate. Don't take for granted, saints of God, the presence of Almighty God. Don't take for granted the Shekinah. Don't take for granted the throne of Almighty God. It, the throne room of Almighty God. It is very, very, very important. Now I want to just gear up to close off. And I want us to note on this slide the actual pattern of the furniture in the tabernacle, in the tent itself. In fact, coming from outside in the outer court all the way into the tent, all the way into the holy place and then into the holy of holies. I want us to look at the pattern that we see. Look from the altar, the brazen altar, and we are going to see and observe something. Notice where the brazen altar is located, how it is located. And then as we leave the brazen altar, we continue on to the brazen laver. And we notice how, yes, it is located. Then as we go further, we go right down straight ahead. We come to the golden altar of incense. Right in the center as we go up. Just look at the strategic patterning of the furniture in the tabernacle in the entire layout as we go further straight ahead of the altar of incense is the ark of the covenant straight up to the top we see the ark of the covenant and so it forms one straight line going all the way up but then look now to the side in the holy of holies in in the holy place sorry we did say three pieces of furniture is there so look to the left of the altar of incense we see the golden lampstand and right position right there and then look to the right of the altar of incense we see the table of showbread brothers and sisters i want us to recognize that what we are seeing here in the tabernacle is a representation of a cross. Can you imagine that the instructions that God gave to Moses thousands of years ago, how we are to lay out the tabernacle, how we are to put the furniture, how we are to pattern the furniture, when we look at it, it literally has a cross in terms of the layout of those pieces of furniture. Can't we see that God Almighty were put together and indicated to us, showed us that a cross was coming 
all that you are seeing here is going to be subsumed in a cross. And the cross is not just a, a two pieces of wood placed in the ground, but someone was going to be hanging on that cross. And what was going to happen with that person who was hanging on that cross, he was going to take care of everything that this tabernacle in the form of a cross represented. When Jesus comes, when he came, he hung there on that cross. That tabernacle was telling us that although you are doing this thing, it is temporary. Something is going to happen in the future that requires a cross. And when that cross is set up and that sacrifice is placed on that cross, it was going to once and for all take care of everything that we are seeing happening in the tabernacle. And it all came to its final, the head came to bump. It all came to a crescendo on that day when Jesus was taken and by wicked hands were cruci was crucified and spread out on the cross. Brothers and sisters, brothers and sisters, this is what was happening. This is what was happening from we started this subject area of the tabernacle in dealing with the church. This is what was happening. Everything was pointing, literally pointing to Calvary and what Jesus was about or would have accomplished in the future. Yes, everything was pointing to Calvary and salvation itself. When Jesus died on the cross and his blood was shed, it represented the blood of the lambs that were slain year upon year upon year back then. Jesus, when he died, he represented the high priest because one high priest had to go into the Holy of Holies. And what actually happened? Look at who Jesus is. Look at what Jesus has done. For the temple sacrifice to be properly executed, you needed a lamb. You needed blood. You needed a high priest. You needed the actual altar, the actual Ark of the Covenant, which represented the presence of God. So you need a God who was going to accept the sacrifice that the high priest came to offer. You needed a, a lamb for the high priest to take that lamb and shed the blood. You actually needed blood that had to be shed. But then before all of that happened, the blood that was shed, it had to be shed on an altar. So you needed an altar. You needed the lamb. You needed blood. You need a high priest. And you had to have God who accepted it all. Can we recognize and appreciate that Jesus was all of those? He was altar was the cross that Jesus died on. He was the lamb. His blood was what was presented. He was the high priest that presented everything to the God and he was the God so that he was the high priest that presented everything to himself. Brothers and sisters, believe it or not, God Almighty by himself purchased our salvation. He became everything. Because no other blood could have done it. No other man could have done it. No other God was there to accept it. And he had to do this thing. Roll up his sleeve and did the entire salvation process and plan by himself. So he became man to be the lamb. And that lamb became the high priest. And that lamb shed the blood. And the high priest took his blood. So Jesus became the lamb, shed his blood, took his own blood, and did everything all by himself. What a God. What a high priest. What a sacrifice. What an awesome 
salvation experience. This is absolutely awesome. And we glorify God and we thank him for what he has done. And brothers and sisters, there is still more that we can extract. And we will extract a few things more when we meet again. And then we wrap up this presentation on the tabernacle and then move on into the church so that we can continue our examination of the church of Jesus Christ. We call it quits for this evening. We bring it to a close. And God's willing, next week, same time, we continue with our Bible study series on the church. And so we say thank you for tuning in. God bless you. And we close for the evening. But let us keep ourselves focused. Let us focus on Jesus. Let us understand who we are. Let us look back on the tabernacle to see exactly what was there and what it represented and who we are and how we ought to live our lives as Christians. And from there, we can become better Christians and draw nearer and nearer to Almighty God. God bless you. Thank you for making it Bible study one more time. To take the time out and to go over and over and over until we grasp and until we catch this thing, help us to apply it to our lives so that our lives will become greater. So we will desire you more and we will desire your presence more and we will become better and greater Christians. Have your own way. Lead us in the right way, in the right path, in the path of righteousness for your name's sake. We bless you, we honor you, we glorify you, great God, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Praise God. Praise God. God richly bless you. Thanks again for making it Bible study. God's willing, next week we pick up again as we continue our series, our Bible study series on the church. God bless you in Jesus' name. Amen.